Fourteen, the friend. In the previous three discourses, Zarathustra urged us to disengage from human society. Does this mean he recommends having no meaningful contact with humans? No, and this discourse will tell us why. One is always too many about me, thinketh the anchorite. Always once one, that maketh two in the long run. I and me are always too earnestly in conversation. How could it be endured if there were not a friend? Nietzsche knew all about being a recluse. He lived a long time without anyone who shared his line of thinking, with whom he could exchange ideas. A sense of loneliness comes through in his early writings, where sometimes he has conversations with his own shadow. This is not a healthy state, and this is why it is imperative to have a friend. Someone to have a meaningful dialogue with. The friend of the anchorite is always the third one. The third one is the cork which preventeth the conversation of the two sinking into the depth. Ah, there are too many depths for all anchorites. Therefore do they long so much for a friend and for his elevation. Our faith in others betrayeth wherein we would fain have faith in ourselves. Our longing for a friend is our betrayer. Talking to oneself for too long can lead one to madness, warns Arthusta. It also makes your own fears and doubts eat you from within. A friend is needed to save you from this fate. And often, with our love, we want merely to overleap envy, and often we attack and make ourselves enemies to conceal that we are vulnerable. Be at least mine enemy, thus speaketh the true reverence, which doth not venture to solicit friendship. If one would have a friend, then must one also be willing to wage war for him, and in order to wage war, one must be capable of being an enemy. An enemy, someone whose ideas you fight against, is also someone who can take you out of your solitude, and is therefore a good thing. One ought still to honor the enemy in one's friend. Canst thou go nigh unto thy friend and not go over to him? In one's friend one shall have one's best enemy. Thou shalt be closest unto him with thy heart when thou withstandest him. Continuing the enemy theme, Zarathustra emphasizes how important it is that you distinguish yourself from your friend. Your friend should also, at times, be your enemy, someone who challenges you on your beliefs, and you should not surrender and submit to him, but stay true to yourself. The best way to be someone's friend is to challenge them and compel them to become stronger. Remember that for Zarathustra, stronger means happier. Thou wouldst wear no raiment before thy friend? It is in honor of thy friend that thou showest thyself to him as thou art, but he wisheth thee to the devil on that account. He who maketh no secret of himself shocketh. So much reason have ye to fear nakedness. I. If ye were gods, ye could then be ashamed of clothing. Thou canst not adorn thyself fine enough for thy friend, for thou shalt be unto him an arrow and a longing for the superman. Zarathustra so expresses his aversion to nakedness, reminding us that we are in the Victorian age. But it should be understood as a metaphor for spiritual nakedness. You should not bear your soul before your friend. Rather, you should overlay it with the character that you developed. The more powerful and interesting your character is, the more it will inspire your friend to want to grow as well. Sawest thou ever thy friend asleep, to know how he looketh? What is usually the countenance of thy friend? It is thine own countenance in a coarse and imperfect mirror. Sawest thou ever thy friend asleep? Wert thou not dismayed at thy friend looking so? O my friend! Man is something that hath to be surpassed. In divining and keeping silence shall the friend be a master. Not everything must thou wish to see. Thy dream shall disclose unto thee what thy friend doeth when awake. In the previous passage he talked about not bearing yourself in front of your friend. Now he warns you not to try to see your friend in his human form, for it will remind you of how wretched you are as well. You aspire towards the superman, but you are still nothing but a man, and being reminded of that too often might bring you down.
The last sentence, Thy dream shall disclose unto thee what thy friend doeth when awake, is vague, but interesting. It seems to be suggesting that our dreams reveal something about our nature. We are seeing the budding of the insight that psychoanalysis will develop shortly after. Let thy pity be a divining, to know first if thy friend wanteth pity. Perhaps he loveth in thee the unmoved eye and the look of eternity. Let thy pity for thy friend be hid under a hard shell. Thou shalt bite out a tooth upon it. Thus will it have delicacy and sweetness. We know that Zarathustra doesn't think much of pity, and believes it doesn't do much good to the one who is pitied. However, here he shows us that he still acknowledges that pity is a human emotion, and should be cultivated. You naturally feel compassion to your friend, but you should be careful not to pity him when he doesn't ask for pity. The friend, he says, can help you control your pity, and understand when it should be expressed. Art thou pure air, and solitude, and bread, and medicine to thy friend? Many a one cannot loosen his own fetters, but is nevertheless his friend's emancipator. Art thou a slave? Then thou canst not be a friend. Art thou a tyrant? Then thou canst not have friends. This, to me, is a very important couplet. Zarathustra speaks of freedom, and says that even if you are not free in spirit, you can still help free your friend, if your friendship is true according to what he just prescribed. His philosophy is a philosophy of freedom, that tells us to overthrow the shackles of external morality, and follow our own code. But here the question arises, what are the boundaries of your freedom? If you reject external morality, doesn't that mean that everything is allowed? Well, according to Zarathustra, you should follow your natural impulses, and a little later we will see that two of the most powerful impulses, according to him, are to obey and to rule. But if you completely give in to these impulses, and become either a slave or a tyrant, you will no longer be able to be a friend. Meaning, you will not be able to have that exchange between two sovereign individuals that challenge each other, and without that, you will not be able to grow stronger, and thus happier. Therefore, for your own good, you should keep the impulses to rule and to obey in check, and aspire to live among free people. Far too long hath there been a slave and a tyrant concealed in woman. On that account, woman is not yet capable of friendship. She knoweth only love. In woman's love there is injustice and blindness to all she doth not love. And even in woman's conscious love, there is still always surprise and lightning and night, along with the light. As yet woman is not capable of friendship. Women are still cats and birds, or at the best, cows. <laughs> A bit of the good old Nietzsche male chauvinism and misogyny here. We'll say more about it in an upcoming chapter. But note that this segment can actually be given a feminist interpretation. Zarathustra is not saying that the nature of the woman is to be this way. He seems to suggest that society made the woman the way she is, and that she has the potential to change. Which a lot of feminists would agree with, except feminism wants to liberate women, while Zarathustra wants to empower them. In other words, he doesn't want to liberate the woman in the way she is, but believes that the woman, just like the man, should be surpassed. The woman should work on herself, go through a process of self-surpassing, and only then will she be someone worthy of being a friend. Zarathustra, then, believes that women are spiritually inferior to men. He compares them to cats and birds, animals that are very swift, suggesting that their thinking moves in a fast and shallow way. At best, they can be cows, which means that they can regurgitate the deeper thoughts created by men. They are not yet at the point where they can join the band of friends that he wants to form on the outskirts of society. As yet woman is not capable of friendship. But tell me, ye men, who of you are capable of friendship? Oh, your poverty, ye men, and your sordidness of soul! As much as ye give to your friend will I give even to my foe, and will not have become poorer thereby. There is comradeship. May there be friendship. Thus spake Zarathustra. 
After speaking of the deficiencies of women, he turns to his male listeners and urges them to ask themselves if they are any better. Most men are not. They know how to be comrades who get together and form a group, but they don't know how to distinguish themselves from each other within that group and become friends who push one another to achieve new heights. Zarathustra is advising us, after we disengage from society, to form ties with individuals who can be friends.